when Kelly decided to build the airplane, he wanted to build a metal that had the structural integrity to stand the harsh environment of Mach 3 speeds at 80,000 feet and also be able to stand the harsh temperatures. As you fly along at Mach 3, all the leading edges of the airplane are between 5 to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The flat surfaces are around 400, 450 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. This piece of glass right in front of my eyes in the front seat on the outside at Mach 3.2 is 622 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside. So he chose titanium for that reason. It has a structural integrity and it can stand the heat. Uh, the basic airplane is designed with two engines in it. Uh, the engine you see behind me is a J58 Pratt & Whitney. Each put in a 34,000 pounds static thrust sea level standard day conditions. So you have a total of 68,000 pounds of thrust coming out of both engines. As you can see with the airplane here, it's uh, very limited on centerline capability. So when one engine, uh, if it quits, you have a, quite a big yawing moment on the aircraft because it's not a centerline airplane. The airplane holds 80,000 pounds of gas. The air refueling door is right here, right behind the RSO's cockpit. And from here on, we have six main fuel tanks, one, two, three, four, five, and six, all the way to the back, down the fuselage, and out to the wings, ever so slightly in tank three. 80,000 pounds of gas. The airplane empty weighs 60,000, so add the two up and you get a 140,000 pound airplane, basically a full gross weight. One of the problems encountered with the, uh, the airplane, uh, flying at hot temperatures at Mach 3, and then coming back down into the cold environment, the heating it back up, back down to the cold environment, the refuel, heating it up. Those heating and cooling cycles anneal the airplane, just like a blacksmith takes a horseshoe and he puts the horseshoe in the cold water, heats it up, cold water, and anneals it and gets stronger and better with time. By the same token, the heating and contracting cycles also shrink parts of it. And the airplane, the skin of the airplane underneath here, it leaked fuel. Not a whole lot, not as much as most people think about. Uh, there's a uh, a lot of things on the internet, internet where it says it drips so profusely that it has to be refueled right after takeoff, and that's a big fallacy. It does leak fuel, and it's in drips. They measure it underneath the airplane in drips per minute. They call it DPMs. They put a stopwatch to it. Every place underneath the airplane had an acceptable tolerance on DPM. Some were 20 drips per minute, some were 40, some were 60, some were 80. Whenever they exceeded this DPMs underneath the airplane, maintenance would have to go in and seal up the tanks on the airplane, which was a nightmare, so they didn't like to do that. All the fuel dripping out of the airplane was collected in very shallow dip drip pans all underneath the airplane, and uh, obviously uh, thrown away after that, you couldn't reuse it.